Hello and welcome everybody to day three of the NHSR um, online conference. Uh, I'd just like to welcome everybody. It was scheduled to be Mohammed today, but I'm taking over and I hope that's okay with everybody. We've got a really full day today of some lightning talks. And I also just wanted to remind people that we've also got an online hybrid part of the conference that's occurring next week. Um, I'll give some more details towards the end, but you can find some information on the NHSR community website, which you can sign up to, either the hybrid event or there are tickets available to be in person in Birmingham. Um, and there'll also be a Python stream this year as well, which is very exciting with some colleagues who use Python. And uh, we might just start a little bit early because um, we've got people ready and we should start at 11 o'clock, but, um, I would just like to introduce Chris Waller on his lightning talk about creating a map with our shiny app. Um, creating a map with our shiny app. Yes, that, that's how it runs. And I'd like to welcome to the floor, Chris, because you don't really want to hear me, you want to hear more about R today. So uh, thank Hi you very everyone. much. Hi there, can you, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Perfect. Hi everyone. Um, so thanks very much for your time this morning. So my name is Chris Waller. I'm a business intelligence manager with Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire Integrated Care Board. And today I'm just going to give a talk to highlight how I've used R to create a tool which um, has helped reduce some demands on some more specialised skill sets within the BNSSG BI team. Um, so a bit of background. Um, so um, I joined the team in uh, 2017 and when I joined the BI team there was a very limited in-house um, GIS capability. So GIS is kind of dealing with mapping and uh, geospatial data. Um, GIS is like a really powerful way of visualizing data in a spatial context and can be really helpful for understanding the, ge um, the geospatial context of, uh, for, to help support sort of focused healthcare projects and interventions and more recently population health management. Um, when I joined, I started to use a free GIS software for sort of some ad hoc mapping work because I had a background in it. I was really keen to do it, but um, we'd outsource most of it at the time. Um, as kind of I did more of this, there was an increased interest in mapping outputs. Um, so I sort of started a program of um, delivering training for other analysts in the BI team um, and helped them to understand sort of some geospatial anal analysis principles. Um, gradually, um, there was a lot of demand and a lot of the analysts who'd had the training didn't weren't able to continue using the specialist software, so weren't always confident in doing the work. Um, but when COVID-19 and PHM hit, we, we saw a huge increase in mapping demand. So everyone was seeing the kind of the patchwork maps on, you know, the, the news, looking at rates of COVID-19 everywhere. And they started to want to add those to their outputs and use those for sort of more decision making. I've been using GIS within R a little bit and I was, I was really keen to explore it. And I thought this would be a really good vehicle to help develop a tool to give almost a self-service tool. Um, so I took it forward from there. So when sort of like deciding what I was going to do, I, I wanted to work out what the parameters were of it. So I did a bit of a scoping exercise and decided that I wanted to be able to produce chloropath maps of the CCG or the ICB area, which are kind of the patchwork quilt maps, which show colours. Uh, it had to be simple to use, that was critical. It had to be really easy to access and it had to be more efficient than using the software itself. Um, what it had to not be, it had to not require any R experience because I didn't want to produce a script or a package which would require somebody to have knowledge of a specific software to use it because otherwise we hadn't really gained much. And also I didn't want it to try and overreach in what it was achieving. So my knowledge of R and R Studio meant I realized an R shiny dashboard would be a really good way of, of approaching this problem. Unfortunately, we, we were running an open source shiny server at the time, so I had somewhere to host it. Um, so in terms of producing a map output or a GIS output, there's a few data requirements which are needed and I needed to understand how these would work within R in order to be able to, to deliver the output. So some of the key things I needed were is like a shape file. So there's lots of different mapping file types, but in particular, we we're using a shape file because we had a load of those already. So for anyone keen, there's Open Geography Portal website, contains a load of free map documents and um, or you can get them through Ordnance Survey and your public sector geospatial agreement if you're in public sector organization and um, so made some bespoke files just for my area in particular. The other thing we needed was a user input so um, all our analysts were really capable at producing um, data extracts from SQL so they could aggregate up their data to a geospatial area so I just needed something that would run off a kind of a, an input file. And also, I needed to work out a way to bring in reference files so that we could plug the gaps for where there wasn't data, so we really had partial data. And it was a really useful way of um, addressing missing data or, or sort of 
ugly looking outputs. Um, and I got these from Open Geography Portal. Um, so I'm just going to kind of jump to a, a on the on the PowerPoint kind of showing what was the output rather than showing the live demo. Just for we'll try the live demo a bit later on. Um, so what happens is um, where this is uh, the output that was produced in our shiny. So this is our shiny app running on our open server. So when the user loads it up, when they access it via our intranet, uh, they're presented with an option to upload a file. So I've limited it in this case to a CSV or an XLS file. They browse to their local file and upload it. Um, then importantly, they select what boundary type they want and they select which data within the data set contains the relevant geo code, um, so the organization code. Um, so once that's loaded, it's reactive and it publishes up a summary of the data. So this is really helpful for helping the user determine that they've picked the correct data, that the data is showing what they think it's showing and giving a summary of kind of this is a, just the top of the data to show kind of what's included, check the data looks sensible, check there's no weird results or anything in the wrong place. It's really easy way of doing a visual inspection. Um, then once they've done that, uh, so kind of just to sort of show what's going on in the background, of, um, what's happening sort of behind the scenes is kind of the user's input in the file. So that's leading R to a data summary, then they're selecting their data type and they're selecting a one or a two measure map along the top. If they select the one variable map or the one measure map, what happens is they're presented with this screen. And so this is a reactive screen, but once they've selected their, um, their user input so whatever value or column within their source data contains the measure that they want to produce an output for this is what's visualized and then here this is kind of a, an aesthetic element so they can do some custom visuals so i've overlaid a load of files so it loads up the respective boundary file to overlay on the map so in this case the locality which is a it's a something be an ssg area which is kind of a groups of practices and it overlays that so you can see the boundaries to help determine where things are and then it instantly transforms the data into this map with no further work required really and i've chosen in this output to include a, a histogram to show the distribution of the data to help sort of the end user see how the data is spread and kind of what values are included there's also the option to enter a custom title here so they just plug in whatever they want and that populates up here and then what the end user would do next is they would what they've been doing really is kind of just saving down that image and then copying it into a presentation or a powerpoint or a word document depending on whatever they're visualizing so behind the scenes what's happening is the user is selecting their metric to visualize <coughs> the input data is being joined to the selected shape file so what's happening is it's basically a left join is happening in the background so what we see here is that in this case the input source is being selected as lsoa <coughs> Um, and then load up the respective file, shape file, which is linked to the LSOA. We then do a geo join. I think other joins are probably now available, but we take the, the data file and we take the user loaded data. I've hard coded what column in the source, in the shape file is the respective lookup. And then it does the join based on the input layer selected by the user. Then what I do just for aesthetic purposes, I, I convert any missing data or null data to a zero because it, it just, just lessons learned meant it was just a prettier map and then this code here is how it's producing the map so i'm using the package tmap for this purpose um i just found it useful and easy to to learn on it was one of the first i learned when i was researching how to do gis and so here i've tried to highlight so this is it's quite a short code to, to generate a map but here is where the user input has been selected and so that loads in a reactive way and then i've got a load of um code for each kind of input a boundary type that's been selected at the front screen. So there's one for MSOA or Ward. Um, the next one um, I added at a later date was um, the user mapping for two measures. So in this case, um, people were sort of beginning to get interested in exploring how the relationship between two variables might be relevant in terms of analysis. So in this one, assuming you've got more than one variable in your data, it, you, you select kind of your X axis and you select your Y axis data. And then what the map does is it visualizes these two and their relationship between the two. So the way this map is working is it's trying to show the relationship between the two variables in a geospatial context. So along this bottom axis here, we're saying where the, um, the X axis is increasing in value. So this is a low X, this is high X, this is low Y, this is high Y, and this is high and high. So the color corresponds to where it would sit in the scale really. So it's shown in the scatter plot up here. So the color corresponds to the corresponding segment. Um, and these have been really well received and it's been a really popular way of, sort of showing different types of data um, 
and sort of exploring the relationship between the different data. And so it's not it's not without criticism in how it's used, really, but it's been quite helpful as a tool for visualizing sort of various different types of data and sort of moving beyond just showing clear rates. And particularly for PHM and other measures, found it to be really helpful. Um, interestingly, um, I, I was pleased with output. I had to borrow quite a lot of code from um, a, a website I found, um, which really helped me in developing this. Um, but I found that people have kind of almost sent this map back to me, not realizing I was involved in creating it at the start and saying, oh, well, we've seen this really nice map and we know you're like map. So we thought, thought you might be really interested in seeing it, which is sort of flattering a bit. Um, but um, I do sort of see it cropping up in a lot of different presentations. Um, I've also got the range, uh, an option to select different, I've coded in a load of different color options to account for different needs and requirements of users. And you can toggle on and off the different labels. So behind the scenes, what's going is you can select the metrics, then the source data is being joined to the file. So both, both all the data being selected, um, then you take the user inputs. Um, then there's a bit of processing that's going on in R. So what's happening is it's kind of basically splitting the data into the quantiles to determine the fill color. And then it, it does some work to determine which of the, the groupings it would be in sort of the one, 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 two, one, three, and vice versa, and adds that back in as a fill column and derives a new data frame to, to just visualize it. And it then generates the maps based on those determined variables. Um, also, what's happening in the background is um, the plot and the scatter, sorry, the legend and the scatter plot are actually GG outputs, GG plot outputs, which are also rendered and overlaid onto the map. So in this instance, I've chosen to use GG plot to, to render this map. It was what was contained in the source data that I had um, and worked really well. And I wasn't about to try and reinvent it or change it, but I found GG plot was a really nice way of visualizing spatial data, but um, you often ended up having to remove a lot of elements kind of for the axes and stuff just to make it kind of look aesthetically pleasing. Um, and there's, there's quite a lot of code that I'll, I'll sort of circulate later on so people can have a look at and, and pour over if they're interested. Um, I was tempted to do a live demo. How are we doing for time? Got two minutes. Um, so I, I, just, I just thought I'd kind of show an action show kind of how it's working. Uh, if I can get to my bottom screen. So. Uh, hopefully you can still see my screen. Uh, really nod. Um, so hopefully you're sort of looking at um, a web browser now. Can you, Zoe? Can you see something? Yes, good. So this is kind of what the end user will see. So this is it in live. So this is sitting on our open server. So um, just to select a file type. Um, see if it works. Yeah, there we go. So then we'll open up a file. So I've picked a just randomly generated a file. Um, there we go. So it loads up the data, you select your boundary, have a look at the source data and check everything. Um, so then if we want to do a one measure map, the user would just kind of go in, sample on that, and it's quite quick. Uh, it loads up the thing, then you could you know, copy it out from there. Or there's a two measure map. Um, so you might want to look at you know, the relationship between any travel time and any attendances, for example. And very quickly, very, very quickly, you go from having nothing, so just a bit of data to a map. So where this has worked really well is that um, I've had feedback to say that people have been actually in meetings and be able to do the data in lifetime and visualize it instantly in the meeting and surface that, um, which with sort of GIS software just wouldn't have been possible. So that's really positive feedback. Um, let's go back to the presentation. So um, I guess kind of just reflecting on it, my sort of um, did it achieve its aims? I feel like, yes, it did um, after the outputs in other people's reports. Had some really positive feedback. For me, it was a really great way of um, learning R. Um, I, I'd always struggled to find a real project to get involved with R. So I knew I wanted to use it, but didn't really know why. And GIS was kind of my in to R. So I found it a really sort of interesting way of learning it because I knew what I was trying to achieve as an output. Um, but it was a very steep learning curve, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the learning points of my reflection, there, there are lots of different ways of doing mapping in, in R and R Shiny. Um, GGPlot, TMAP, and Leaflet are sort of the three main ones I found. Um, so if anyone's interested, I recommend exploring them all because they all serve slightly different purposes. Um, I learned that commenting is really important in scripts um, because um, I didn't really do it very well at the start and it, 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 was, it was a pain after the fact. Um, I learned that when using shape files, using super generalized ones is really important. Um, so they're just a lot lower size. So it helps improve performance. And also if I was to do it again, I'd really think about reproducibility when developing. It's really difficult to retrospectively adjust a, a dashboard to, to be applicable in multiple situations. Um, and that's kind of, that was one of my, my key reflections really. Um, kind of, I'm nearly at time. So that concludes my presentation this morning. Um, so just put it out to any questions. There's my email there. If anyone wants to contact me directly in relation to this, um, I'd be more than happy to, to talk further about it. 
Um, but I just end by saying thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, wonderful and great timing as well. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. One of them, I think you might have covered, um, is it just analysts who use this or have you opened it up to wider colleagues and seeing as you got kind of your own chart back, <laughs> I yeah, wonder so, how far it reached. So um, I've, I've hosted it, it's on our intranet. So anybody in our ICD organization can access it. Um, the access to the data itself is usually the problem. So there was, there's nothing pre preventing other people from using it. And I'd be really thrilled for them to use it. And my main ambition was to free up the time Put on so I basically if somebody asked for one of these maps for GIS I, I then bounce them back to the website in the first instance and that's been really good and it means the GIS well not specialist analysts but they can focus more on analytical products um, and the other question is and I, I like to see this it's really impressive is it on github no can not yet code no, I, out? do you need help to get it out yeah probably <laughs> I, I'll definitely look to get it up I really that I've had a, a few thoughts about developments. I really want, want to be able to dynamically bring in the shape file itself. Um, so I'm trying to engage with Ordnance Survey at the minute to work out the best way to do that through the public oh, uh, special agreement. But yes, definitely really happy to share it. Really happy to. Wonderful. And um, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for that. Thank you for your time. And as Kate. we set up the next one, which the next talk, which will be from Jeremy Selva. He's actually coming in from a different country, um, from Singapore. So welcome. I'm so pleased that you're coming from such a, a far away distance um viewing multiple interactive plots using plotly and trelliscope js in a quarto presentation which is beautiful take the floor jeremy hello uh, thank you for the kind introduction i will first like to start this talk by introducing what lipids are and the work that my lab does so in short lipids are organic compounds they are mostly insoluble in water and then you may know some of the common ones like cholesterol and triglycerides measured in the blood lipid tunnel test. However, for the not so common one, this is how our lab measures it. So take our blood samples, for example, we add some chemicals to separate the lipids from the protein and DNA. Next, we create a list of transitions to tell the machine on the right here, the mass spectrometer, what kind of lipids to measure. And then the machine will give up these results in the form of peaks within a certain acquisition time range, and we integrate the area under the peaks, which gives us this peak area data that we have here. Now, the mass spectrometer is a very sensitive machine, so it's able to measure signals from external sources as well, such as contaminant ions. And hence, we use some quality control samples to measure these variations from these external sources. And the key is to keep those molecules or those transitions that we measure that have low variation on the quality control samples. As such, we usually give the plot like this, like a simple scattered plot of peak areas over the injection sequence of run. And we have these uh, quality controls that we plot together at the same time. And to measure the variation, we use the coefficient of variation marked by the word CB, which is just the ratio between the standard deviation and the mean. And these uh, plots and statistical results for each transition are expressed as one page in the PDF file. However, as technology advances, uh, the workflow can measure up to a few hundred molecules. And this gives a PDF file of over 500 pages full of plots. And looking at these static plots individually, one by one, to gain insight of the data, it's a very tedious process. And if my manager uh, were to ask me for the results and say that I want to see everything, but if I were to give him this PDF file, which has everything in it, he will ask me questions like, oh, okay, this is fine. So out of these 500 molecules, like I see some outliers over here. Can you tell me more information about it? Or something like, oh, how many ceramides, which are those molecules that starts with CER, have high variation? And these are questions that I cannot answer immediately with this PDF files and static plots I have. So in the end, I have a lot of these back and forth meetings, which is very time consuming. If my manager were to ask me to plot the same data, but in a different way, like a rain cloud plot or dilution series plot, it restarts this vicious cycle of creating more PDF files of over 500 pages full of plots. Hence, there's a need for a better solution for this. And Thankfully, there's Plotly that's able to make these plots interactive. 
And this seems to be the right direction for me. However, the distribution of these uh, results remains a challenge because interactive plots cannot be stored in PDF files. So I did consider using Shiny, but I was precluded from using it because I lack the expertise to maintain a secure web server that meets the standard of the IT team. And as my managers are not trained in R, I cannot expect them to run the whole R script by themselves or even to install all these R, R packages just to rebuild the whole Shiny package and view the results. It is just too much work for them. Thankfully, there is another package called Telescope.js that's able to give an output like this. And I can just compress them and send to my collaborators and managers. And clicking on this index.html file will give a result something like this. So uh, for the case of the internal standard, what I can do is that I speak this to true. And then this is the eight compound. So for the case of the two outliers that I have, what I can do is just double click on it and hover on the outline samples to find out more information about it on the spot. For the case of the ceramides having high variation, what I can do is that it's a group, so I can filter it by class and then hit the, the QC variation and mark it over 12%. 20%. And now I know that 53 out of 85 of my ceramides have high variation. And for the case of building different kinds of plot, there are two ways I can do it. One is to view them separately like this. Just let me refresh the screen. And then to view it like this, and I can view the grids like that. Or I can uh, do it together as well to set a layout. So what I can do is I can make it bigger and this one to be smaller and this right. And now I can see both of the plots or other kind of multiple plots at the same time. So now that I shared my reasons why I use these two R packages, I next few slides I just provide some like tips and examples of how the how we can build one for ourselves as well. So all this data set that you see here comes from a published uh, paper actually. So it's open access and I just download the data from there. And I created a document in Quarto to give a walkthrough and step-by-step -step approach of how to create the plots that you see earlier. So this slide tells you that uh, the Triscope JS has a function called the PMAT underscore plot, which is similar to how the per hour package PMAP works is that together with did player mutate, it's able to create a column full of these interactive plots. So this one, this plot here, this line here is actually one interactive plot, which you can call in the R console to take a look at them individually. It is important sometimes to provide metadata information, especially for those new users using this like Telescope GS output to provide a good user experience. And to view this metadata information, you can press the information button or to hover onto the panels to see what this, uh, what this like product ion or precursor ion, what are they supposed to mean? And my quarter document is provide, has to provide some step-by-step -step guides on how this can be done. Next, next, I want to talk about results distribution. So to create an output from Telescope.js, what you need is to set a working directory. And then you call the script Telescope onto the R console. Just set the path to be the name of the folder you want to output. And set the self contained to force to output these folders and files. And click on the index.html file will give the output that you need. And all you have to do is just compress it to a zip folder. And you can send it to your collaborators and managers to use. As you can see in my output example, my, it's also possible to embed it in a Quarto document as well. So it's kind of similar to the previous uh, one. The difference is that in the Quarto, the YAML configuration, you can also set the self-contained to false so that when you press the render button, you create these additional folders in green. And all you do is just choose all these selected 
folders and files that, it, that the machine has output and compress them. And you can send them to your collaborators and managers. So I have a GitHub page that stores all these uh, results. And this is the same GitHub page that stores the source code for my walkthrough example here. And there are also other examples of what Triscope.js has provided. And uh, I'd like to show one of them, which is this one here, because I didn't know that Triscope.js can also do this uh, functionality, is that it's able to have a hyperlink as well, linking to some database and data set, which I find it very useful. Triscope.js is also presented during the R Studio 2017 conference, and it was also uh, there's also one presentation of its application during the Use R 2022 conference as 2022 conference as well. So this is all I have to share. And the summary is that I hope I've just showed like how the uh, how my lab works in using quality control samples to check for unwanted variation in the lipidomics workflow. And now, Plotly and Triscope GS has been a lifesaver for me because it helps me to view these interactive plots in an effective way and to gain valuable insights without wasting too much time and effort. And I hope that the slides that I showed through the chat and the examples that I provided will be useful for you to be able to make one for yourself. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I hope you have a great time. Thank you so much. Um, we can see some claps coming up here. Uh, another comment saying, brilliant, great piece of work. Lovely looking presentation. I have to agree with Quarto. Um, keen to try it out. You've sh if you could share the GitHub, that would be wonderful because I know you've shared the website link. That would be good. I'm okay. quite interested because there are no questions as such, but how did you find out about the Trellis Scope JS at the conference, the R Studio conference, or did you see it prior to that? Uh, I still didn't know it was presented in the R Studio conference. But so actually what I did, because I actually familiarized with Trellis Plot when I worked in the previous company, because they actually use Spotfire and uh, they use a Trellis Plot to view like these multiple data. So I was thinking whether R could also do that as well. And when I type in like Trellis Plot in R, then somehow uh, uh, maybe it didn't appear for this Google page, but somehow I encountered it and just try it out for myself. And somehow it was like a lifesaver and a dream come true for me. Yeah, that's wonderful. So have you also done Shiny apps as well? Or was it that you chose this over Shiny? Because you did say it could be a bit more time to work on. Uh, the main issue is that I don't have a server to present my oh. results. So even though That's I can true. write it in Shiny, mm. uh, the distribution of the results is really a challenge because yeah. I need to send to my collaborators, which may be outside of the university and these kind of things. And it's hard to distribute them mm. when I don't have a server that has a private domain, especially when you have to share data that is like confidential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's of course, definitely... if there, I have a server and now that the Shiny in Python is able to run but a server, it could also be a po another possibility as well. That is a key problem that we have throughout NHS and local authorities. It's the sharing of the information. So we do have that problem with Shiny apps and hosting them. That's, that's an interesting point. Um, I don't think any other questions have come through. I think you might get a few maybe directly on GitHub, maybe, or even just to also promote to you and to other people who may be watching this either now or later on YouTube when this goes on. Um, we have an NHSR Slack group, which people are welcome to join us. It's not just for the NHS and it's not just for R now. So we've kind of extended it to NHS and well, we've always been welcoming of colleagues around the world in different organizations, but this conference is also welcoming and introducing some people from our Python side of the NHS as well. So you're very welcome to join that. And also NHS PyCom have a particular Slack group as well. So we kind of move between two of them. So thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. That's very inspiring. And 
I if Kieran Dale is available next, yay, you've got your, your picture up now. Um, you're going to be talking about optimizing patient flows in ED or emergency departments, also known in the UK quite often as accident and emergency, but we have so many acronyms, we just uh, we just add to them, I suppose. So if you'd like to start your presentation, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Of course. And and thank you, Jeremy, for your presentation. So I wonder. There we go. Great. So um, just to introduce myself very quickly. My name is Kieran Dale and I'm a senior analyst at a small healthcare analytics consultancy called Edge Health. Today we'll be speaking a bit about optimizing patient flows in emergency departments. And I may use a &E or emergency floor like as terms interchangeably. Another title before the presentation could be, you know, how R affords data scientists and data analysts infinite freedom to model complex scenarios. In this situation, how this relates to improving decision-making in hospitals. So the problem statement. So a large hospital trust approached us needing to know how best to remodel their emergency floor. So essentially how large to make each section how future changes to clinical pathways would affect occupancy and how best to plan for future changes to their provision of care. So what did their data look like? It was large, so there was around 150,000 a and &E attendances per year with many data fields for each attendance. It's pseudonymized, so we only had patient IDs, so nothing identifiable. It contained entry and exit times for locations on the emergency floor. And the data contained locations within ED. So a patient is triaged, then moves to the waiting room, et cetera. There was also location data downstream of the emergency department. So admission to different wards in the same hospital. So what happens if we plot all these pathways for one year? And the answer is it got very complicated. So these are a lot of pathways. So on the left, there's the front door and then a all the, all the different boxes are sort of locations within the emergency department. So they're, these are basically all the various paths eventually leading to either downstream admission or, or um, the patient being discharged to going home. So we're gonna be talking a bit about the challenges associated with dealing with these large formats, often in a very impractical format and transforming them into tools that can help in emergency department planning. So for obvious reasons, I couldn't use their actual data. So I had to sort of synthesize some ED data. So this is our very simple emergency department that we'll, we'll work with. Um, and, and the script, um, creating all the plots and creating all the data is on GitHub, if you'd like to access it. So basically a patient arrives at triage, about a fifth go home straight away, um, in our ED. So that could be stream to primary or, or community-based care. It could also mean a direct referral to say a fracture clinic that isn't in the emergency department. So most people um, wait for around three hours, then they'll have a consultation, which is around 30 minutes. They'll be sent home within three to four hours and or, or they might be admitted to a downstream ward or an observation area. So all up that stay for around five or six hours. So very helpfully, the NHS has already synthesized um, accident and emergency data, which is, which is great. Um, these data are extremely useful because it retains all the statistical characteristics of real data. So sort of typical distributions of diagnosis codes, arrival mode, lengths of stay, but in this synthesized data set, locations aren't available. So it's not very useful for optimizing patient pathways. But anyway, back to our synthesized data, how does it look? So it tracks pathways through ED, which is, which is great. So you'll see along the X axis, um, the time during the day, and each bar represents a patient journey. So each color of the bar is sort of a location within ED. Patient arrives, is in triage for a certain amount of time, then goes to a waiting room, then has a consultation, then possibly goes to a ward. If you're wondering why I chose the A down the bottom, it's my birthday, July 7th, 
lucky day. So what trends can we draw out from the data? So there's, there's a lot we can, we can extract. So this sort of activity projections, weekdays, busy periods, um, length of stay within certain locations on the, in, in, sorry, <laughs> on the emergency floor, um, which is all descriptive and very interesting. We sort of already know all this. Um, the real utility in knowing entry and exit times, different locations within ED, is that we can track individual patient journeys and, and how they progress through the emergency department. Can also capture sort of the ebb and flow of ED. So there are busy periods, there are less busy periods, and we can track that during a single day. And it's so important, I'm gonna highlight it. So back to my original point, anyone in an ED could tell you where typ patients typically go and how long they spend there. So for example, um, this is over the course of a year. So triage is quite quick. Then there's around three hours in a waiting room, then around 40 minutes for a consultation, then around one hour in some downstream ward or observation area. So that's great. Um, but how about we look at the variation within a single week? So down the bottom, you have the day of the week and along the y-axis is the time during the day. And obviously the more red the tile is, the busier the hour is. So we see a lot of dark red areas between seven and 9 a.m. So around here and from around three to 10 p.m. And it's, it's a lovely heat map, but again, we, we already knew that mornings and evenings are busy in emergency departments, particularly on weekends. So any nurse or doctor or support staff could tell you this. So this is great, it's descriptive, it's interesting on a macro level. How can we turn the data into something practical that helps with planning? I think we need something a bit more granular. So let's look a bit more closely at some ED location data. So each column contains either entry or exit times and each row is for a patient attending ED. So we see um, someone enter triage and they go to a waiting room then they go to a consultation with an ED doctor and then onwards to a ward. So let's look at when each patient enters and leave, leaves each ward. So here we see patient one enters ward one at 4 a.m. and leaves at 5 a.m. So this is just the start and end times for four different wards. And we kind of want to see how the occupancy changes within these wards. So we need to turn this into some measure of occupancy. So um, how about we count how many patients are in each location on every half hour? So this is just for ward one. And it's great because we see the occupancy levels fluctuating. So five, four, three, six as, as patients enter and leave that particular ward. And uh, because this is a data science conference, um, just a quick shout out to the following packages. Um, split stack shape and lubridate um, made working with interval objects. The whole exercise was so much easier with interval objects. Great packages, great functions. Okay, so this is a plot of the occupancy over time for a whole year for four different wards. So along the x axis is time, and then the y axis is, is beds or bays occupied. So we can see how the occupancy changes over time for the whole year, but it's very noisy. So we can see the moving average, that blue line. It stays pretty constant, say for Ward 1, around, around 10, 10 bays or beds occupied, but there are large peaks during, during the day. So at some points, um, there are up to 35 patients in this, in this um in this ward and then for a lot of the year as well, there, there are no patients in there. So it's not terribly realistic, but it does raise an important point. <clears throat> to turn this into a tool for planning, we have to have a good understanding of the macro, so average length of stay in the ward, activity projections, but also what the micro look like. So what would a busy day be like in this ward? And more importantly, we have to plan for that busy day. So this is a more zoomed in view 
and we see how the occupancy within wards change over time. So there's a lot of variation even over the course of three days. So again, these peaks, so for ward one, they're, they're around, you know, you can go from around one better bay occupied to almost 25. So it's unrealistic, but it's illustrate, illustrative. So I suppose, um, what's the point of this whole exercise? And I think this is probably the most important slide of the whole presentation. So we've done a lot of cool stuff using R. We've combined a more macro view of how an ED functions, and we can see the natural ebb and flow of ED and occupancy in different sections. So more micro changes. So how can we sort of combine the two to help with hospital planning? So like many things in the NHS, this is none other than a constrained optimization problem. We have a certain amount of space or money or staff. We're limited by the size of the estate as well. So how do we use data to solve this problem? And yes, that is a curtain in front of a chart. Um, making the most of data is great because we really have limitless options to tweak, sample and re-sample existing data to answer our questions. So for, for example, what happens if because of new portable ultrasounds that we use in future, it means patients will stay 20% shorter in a certain location? What does this mean for overall occupancy? What does this mean for our plans in 10, 20 or 30 years time in that emergency department? Or say, what happens if every patient with a thumb fracture will be streamed straight to a fracture clinic and avoid ED altogether? Dramatic effect. So um, this, is, this is one way of using the data to solve a problem. So along the x-axis, we have the time in a normal day and the colors are the locations in ED. And this is sort of the median occupancy. So as we can see from this plot, it's around ordinarily around 10 in the waiting room, around three being seen, around three in an observation room award and you know, up around 18 at the busiest time at 10 p.m. Um, and then again, we can look at the busiest day of the year because that's what's most important. That's what we need to plan for. So this is the 95th percentile day by occupancy. And at the busiest time, again, around 10 p.m., there's up around 30 people in the emergency department. So this is a useful tool to visualize the problem. But then the most important step is then to work closely with clinical and operational staff to then determine what are the levers that we can pull to reduce occupancy, streamline pathways in ED and ensure we aren't over capacity. We can then use historical data with our proposed pathway changes to demonstrate that. Say, if you can only have 25 people in ED at a given, given time, then these are the concrete changes that will need to be implemented for this to happen. So just a quick conclusion, we've spoken about some ways to extract value from ED data and for it to aid decision-making, but your analysis should, should always aid decision-making. Um, so basically, how can we work together with clinical operational and estates leads at hospitals to make the most of our limited resources? Um, and of course, be curious and exploratory. So there's, there's lots to learn from interrogating ED data. I know I've learned a lot. So just try things, see if they work. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much. That was great. I like the big reveal as well. Lots of claps. Um, oh, no particular questions. I shared in the chat, the A&E synthetic data set that you referred to. Um, that was created by some colleagues who have been on NHSR community and they shared that. So I, I knew where it was. So it's nice to also have that reference. But it'd be great to have your GitHub too shared. I'm sure people would really like to see that. I'd like to see your synthetic data set too. Um, and you're quite right. There's a lot to be learned from just exploring the data. So I um, haven't got any questions on that. But some questions are coming into the chat after the talk. So if you can continue joining us, that'd be wonderful. Or join us in the NHSR Slack and we can continue the conversation there, I'm sure. So I can see somebody's already, two people, sorry, it was hidden on my screen. We're gonna have a, a, a double group today. Um, the next one, the next talk will be from Fionn Thomas and Danielle Hearn on combining our shiny and our markdown to create a user-centered 
interactive web application. There's a lot of work involved in this, I'm sure. So I look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. Share my screen. There we go. Hopefully that's all shared. Yes. Back. Um, so hi, I'm Fionn. I'm here with my colleague Danny. We're from the observatory and cancer analytical team at Public Health Wings, where we transform data into public health intelligence to support decision makers and public health with health information. So we're really, really pleased to be here today and have this opportunity to kind of showcase some of the possibilities with R and really how it can benefit health services. So we're hoping we can achieve that today by showing you how we created a user-centered interactive web application. Hello, everybody. Yes, I think we've just got a, a frozen screen. I just asked in the chat if it was just me. Uh, I think we've got a technical hitch and we've, we've got Danielle back. Um, I think I'm back. Yeah, and you're back. Wonderful. That was quick. So, um, sorry, do, should we start again? Sorry about that. Technical yeah. glitches. I will just wait for you to share your screen and then okay. we'll start again. We've got okay. some minutes. It's fine. Yeah, no problem. I'll just reshare that. Like the, like the professionals do, don't they? They just kind of carry on, start again. Yeah, it's sharing now. Happen. Wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll head back to the first slide. So again, just a quick introduction. Me and Danny, we're from um, the Observation Cancer Analytical Team at Public Health Wales, where we transform data into public health intelligence to support decision makers and the public with health information. So we're really pleased to be here, have this opportunity, showcase some possibilities with R, and particularly talk about how we can really benefit health services. So hopefully we'll do that by giving you an insight as to how we created a user-centered interactive web application by combining R Shiny and R Markdown. We're actually following on a little bit from a presentation our colleagues gave last year. So Hugo Kosh and Zoe Strawbridge um, presented at last year's our conference and they presented on how to use Shiny with our markdown. They put some resources together. Hopefully the link's in the chat and we can repost that if it's not there. And it's a really good place to get started if you're really new to kind of our Shiny and our markdown together. So today we're going to kind of take that next step and look at what the other elements that feed into creating an application or a dashboard and how we ensured a user-centered design when doing so. So a little bit of background. Our team works hard to design valuable and informative web apps. And our key aim is to deliver public health intelligence in the most effective ways to our users. So what that means is that we design products that share information with users in a way they can understand, but also a way that supports their work. So for example, designing outputs that policymakers can use to plan interventions. So wanting to ensure where we kind of in keep with these aims has resulted in us moving towards agile ways of working and also adopting user-centered design. So what that means is we identify who our users are and create a user group. And then we carry out an iterative design process. We have these frequent releases for user feedback just to ensure that we're continuing to meet their needs as the product develops so the final output is useful to them. So here's what our initial kind of cancer mortality dashboard looked like. And this was where moving to Agile highlighted the need for improvement to it. So in our initial user engagement meeting, the users kind of brought our attention to the fact that the interface didn't really suit them. They found it quite difficult to navigate and the interactions were self-explanatory enough. They also mentioned that there was lack of commentary just because we had um, charts and tables and that made it difficult for them to understand the context of the data and they felt it was particularly missing a key summary and some overviews. They also mentioned it was quite time consuming to use because the charts and the tabs were quite slow to load and um, so to us that suggested we needed to really look at in on the coding and see how we could make that more efficient. 
So we took this feedback, combined it with our team aims and also our team ethos. So ethos is that we always want to create products that are reproducible, they're scalable, but also ensure a sharing of knowledge across the team. So we came up with that aim and that was to develop an interactive web application that can be updated easily and quickly, but also displays requested information to users in an effective way. So R was fundamental to us achieving kind of all of the above requirements. So one of the first reasons we chose R was because we did have previous knowledge of the coding language, but we were still quite new to developing applications. For me and Danny, it was only our kind of second ever dashboard. And we even had a new starter on the team who'd never coded R before, but was able to create their own indicator entirely. So that partly comes down to how we organize our project teams where we have um, analysts with various levels of skills, then we're all given our own script so we can work on developing different areas of the app, but helping each other out within that. Or well, you'll see a little bit later on how R is really helpful in kind of sticking with that way of working. The key reason we chose R was because of this high speed and efficient processing of large data sets, particularly because of the wealth of packages that it has. So by combining Shiny and Markdown, we could create an application that suited our users, but also fit our team ethos and aims. So again, if anyone's really new to Shiny and Markdown, I urge you to look at those learning resources because they are really good for kind of building that foundation. But Shiny ultimately is an easy way to build interactive web apps straight from R. And when you combine that with our Markdown, it does provide kind of one of the easiest ways to build these lightweight Shiny apps. So the reason for that, in brief, is rather than have a back end and a front end, everything is in one script. And particularly kind of for us as a team who felt quite novice in developing dashboards, it took away a lot of that complex side of working on two separate scripts. And it also helps with kind of developing interactive uh, charts and tables in just one step. So we found that a lot easier. Obviously, there is a downside in that there's some less flexibility than if you did shiny apps only. But for what we wanted to code and create, we didn't have any problems. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Danny, who's going to talk about some, some of the ways we achieved those initial aims. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Fionn. So one of the key aims of this project was to create an interactive space which could be tailored by users and stakeholders to meet their individual and unique data needs. So we achieved this using Shiny as we found that Shiny could provide the level of interactivity that we required. So Shiny can be used to transform data analysis and visualization into a complete, easy to use and interactive product which delivers insight and value to stakeholders. Shiny's framework also allows customization of applications to better suit the branding of your organization. So for example, you can add logos and you can also make changes to the colors and fonts of the application. Shiny then has a range of high quality interactive features which enable users to customize the information displayed to better suit their needs. So just to give a quick example of what can be achieved in terms of interactivity, I've included a screenshot on the right of one of our indicators from the cancer mortality dashboard. And so just to highlight some of the features, at the top you can see multiple I think the link's gone again. I think I can see the two people, but they're not talking anymore. There must must be the uh, the broadband. I'm gonna just give it another second again to see if they can reconnect because they were super quick coming back last time. The screen's still being shared, which is interesting. Um, but I hope our colleagues can come back. Keep waiting is the message. They're probably logging back in. Hello, you're back again. Oh, sorry. Hi, that's okay. It's a technical thing. Um, sorry, Risha. Yeah. Um, oh, Danny's Stan back. Yeah. <gasps> Mid sentence. Uh, <laughs> technology, <laughs> eh? <laughs> I reshared the screen now, Danny. Wonderful. That's okay. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks. Um. So I'll just recap from the <laughs> charts and visualizations. So finally, we wanted to create a high quality, uh, high quality and engaging data visualizations 
And we combined the GG uh, plot and Plotly packages to do this, as we found that the packages provided a range of visualizations, including bar charts, tables, maps, among others. And also there was the option to add error bars, which you can see to the charts, data labels, and use tooltips to add hover over labels as well. So overall, we found using Shiny and R to be an engaging way to communicate and organize a large amount of data and information in a quick and easy to take in format. <clears throat> so another one of the key aims of this project was to create a web application that could be updated easily and quickly, and that could be updated by anyone in the team. So one of the methods we used to achieve this was modularization. For anyone who doesn't no modularization is the process of separating or dividing a product into smaller interchangeable components so in practice this involved creating separate independent r scripts for different indicators and we also looked to separate out any functions or analysis scripts that we had written so just to give a quick diagram of how that worked in practice you can see on the right the, the separate scripts for each indicator, and these were read in by the master script, which we could then run to produce the web application. So the benefits of modularization included shorter scripts with digestible code, um, and we made sure that scripts were well commented and named appropriately so that they could be picked up and reviewed easily by other members in the project team. And as a result, code was generally easier to read and to understand. <laughs> It also supported collaboration within the team, since analysts had uh, their own indicators to work on, and it also meant that we could have members of the project team, as Phil mentioned, with mixed levels of experience in R. Um, and analysts were able to build a minimum working example without fear of breaking other indicators or components of the web application. So this had the dual benefit of supporting team learning, which feeds into the team ethos of sharing uh, knowledge, and it also meant the bugs and errors were localized and thus easier to find and to fix. And then finally, it promotes scalability since further components can be added without breaking existing scripts and changes to the appearance and the content of the web application can be made easily without the need to rewrite entire sections of code. So this fitted in with the agile ways of working as it made it easier to produce different iterations of the application. So some other methods we use to make sure that the web application could be updated easily and quickly um, included writing reproducible analytical pipelines or wraps and making use of functions. So wraps are programs that automate statistical and analytical processes, and a function is a block of code that performs a particular task. So using wraps enabled us to fully automate our analytical processes from data extraction and analysis through to visualization and creating the web application itself. And this meant that it was easier to quality assure the analysis compared with manual processes as there was a clear audit trail. And this led to a higher quality analysis that our users could trust. Wraps also increase the efficiency of statistical and analytical processes, as once the code is written and checked, it's quick and easy to update, as it can be refreshed as one process. Um, we were also able to include data from multiple sources and to read that in quickly, and this aided with timeliness of the data that we were outputting, which was key feedback from that we got from users, so that was really good as well. And then finally, using wraps and functions reduced or minimized the risk of introducing bugs into the code as it reduced the time spent clicking between different software programs and copying pasting sections of code. So just to give a, a really small example of a function that we did use within the application, this is a function that creates a data caveat whenever the user selects the 2021 data year. Um, so I'm just going to hand back now to Fionn for the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Sani. So the final thing that we wanted to achieve was to be able to display information effectively to our users. So this really meant having that user-centered design, and Agile was pretty much key to that. So it's about delivering that work in small increments for feedback. Unfortunately, in this kind of production, we weren't able to do that. But what we did do was get feedback at the start to try and have something to work towards. And then we did get feedback at the end. And the feedback at the end really showcased that we were able to deliver a useful product on how Agile can be really helpful. 
So one bit of feedback was people would agree to be involved in the process because it does make their job easier in the long run. But one of our favourite bits of feedback was someone was satisfied with the product and its assistance in shaping future planning. So showing that we can actually have impact on health services as a whole, which is great. But there are some limitations to user engagement, which we also wanted to mention. So firstly, it's not always easy to get the level of engagement you really like, particularly, you know, within healthcare, everyone is super, super busy. So finding that time can be difficult, but also it's difficult to meet the needs of all users. And that's something you've got to try and manage from kind of the get go. But Shiny obviously was going to be the second part that helped with displaying this information. And Shiny actually works really well with agile methods. They really suit each other. You can make those quick changes in Shiny. You can implement enhancements quite easily, and particularly with the way that we worked that with modularization. Also, you can have those kind of different views of data. So that helped different users drill down to the more detailed views of data that's relevant to them. And finally, those diversity of outputs that you can get with Shiny. It's sounding like the link's gone again. Oh dear. I thought we'd get through with just a couple of glitches, but we've gone for the hat trick, as they say, with three glitches. So just give them a couple of minutes, well, a minute or so. They were back really quickly last time. And I'm hoping they'll come back. This is when we need some. Hey, there you go. I was going to say we needed some music, but then you appeared. So it be, be on you a mid sentence again. Hat trick. We did a hat trick of glitches. Um, I think that was pretty much the end. Oh. We will put a link. Uh, we were just at the end oh. going through what the final product looked like, but we can put a link to in the chat. Wonderful. Yes, please. That'd be great. There was a great question, and I'm not too sure how it would affect you because you're working with public health data. But in terms of using a Shiny app and protected sensitive data, I don't know if you used any of that at all, for example. Did you have to make it pre-aggregate beforehand, or is it that your area is already aggregated? No, it was something that we had to consider and it's something that feeds into some of our pipelines actually. So particularly when it comes down to small numbers, we always ensure that we don't show those kind of things. Brilliant. There, there's a bit more interaction there as well. So you're quite welcome to us to keep with that discussion. Uh, we'll move on. So sorry we had the technical glitches, but you you dealt with those wonderfully and I really appreciate both your full talk. There was a lot in there about how to do data science as much as doing it and uh, it'd be great to keep that conversation going in some other areas as well thank you so, thank you so much for having me <laughs> now i've got another double uh, bill as they say together we've got alex reed and robert john mitchell and you're going to be talking about using using our shiny again i thought am i reading the right bit our shiny again for statistical disclosure control data and other applications which kind of ties in with that very last question i think so i'll let you take the floor and do your talk. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. So uh, I'm a part of uh, PHS and the Kai Linkage team, as says, as says Alex Reed. And today we're going to go through a, a Shiny app, which was designed for statistical disclosure control, as well as uh, other uh, applications. So just share my screen just now. It's sharing. Ah, there we go. Great. Can you see the presentation okay? Yeah, we can see the whole thing though. We can see next slide as well. I didn't know if you wanted that particular. Oh, definitely not. No. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's the secret presenter presenter yeah, mode, isn't it? It is, yeah. So I'll just uh... yeah, does that there look better go. now? That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, so our presentation is using R Shiny for statistical disclosure control data, as well as other applications. So firstly, what is SDC or statistical disclosure control? SDC is a technique that's used in data-driven projects, and this is to reduce the risk of individuals or bodies being identified from the analysis of survey data, as well as other data sets. The main purpose of SDC is to aggravate or modify data prior, prior to uh, following a risk assessment prior to release. 
So the main purpose of STC is to modify lower numerical values in a data set before release. And this is due to the fact that lower numerical values could be used to identify individuals for sensitive data. So with regards to uh, using a Shiny app, so our head of service asked for a standard method to be developed. And this was to apply SDC techniques using RStudio. It was decided to use uh, RShiny. And this was due to the fact that it was e would be easier to use for those with uh, minimal R experience. So if I have a discussion here on the SDC Shiny app for the pros and cons. So the main, probably the main pro for us is that it requires a minimal coding for a variety of tasks. So this is reading in a variety of different data sets quickly, such as CSV files, as well as XLSX files. Uh, data cleaning for uh, data prior to SDC methods being applied. Uh, minimal coding for applying complex functions to be implemented. So this includes filtering and formatting of data, as well as SDC methods. Uh, the app allows a uh, data visualization of both pre and post SDC data. So this reduces the risk of uh, human error due to any of the various features used within the app. So with regards to the cons of SDC, so probably the main one would be that it does require a knowledge of R to develop and maintain the apps. And this can be quite challenging if any of the app developers are no longer working on it. And another con is currently there's no online app hosting service as of yet for personal data. So this means that the current version of the app that will be demonstrated today has no file upload or file download section. And uh, the reason that there's no online app hosting service as of yet is this Scotland Shiny server is hosted outside of the UK. And due to information governance, this doesn't allow the upload of sensitive data. So with regards to some of the opportunities from this app, so a module of coding structure has been developed for this app. So this has been, can be used to simplify the design of other Shiny apps. And this allows new techniques to be added to the app at a later stage, such as recoding variables. So also later this year, there will be an online app hosting service starting. So this will allow for the use of personal data with the SDC app. And just to give an example here of the Shiny app coding structure. So the blue boxes in the, the, the slide here are the main sections of code. So initially what you would do is uh, set up the file paths. This is where the main app.r script for the Shiny app is contained, as well as the various subscripts. Uh, the first section of the script, which is before the app itself, is sections such as the packages used within the app, the PHS branding, the various functions, as well as reading the dummy data into the app. The next section here is the user interface. So this is the app designs, which is essentially how the app looks. This is where this coding structure is probably uh, most effective. And this is due to the fact that the user interface in particular has a large number of brackets within the code. And splitting this section up into various subscripts uh, improves readability of the code. The server section is, how, is the code for how the app itself works. So the layout of this section with regards to the subscripts is very similar to the user interface. And uh, once you have the, this after this section, you then uh, run the app, so run Shiny app. So the main advantage probably of this code is if any new sections of code have to be added to the app at any point, it can be uh, dropped into the app via separate scripts. And I'm now going to do a demonstration of the Shiny app now. So. Can everyone see the Shiny app OK? Yes, I can. That's good. So the first section here is just the home tab. So this has uh, instructions on how to utilize the app. So like what step to do to process data and go through SDC. Section here on the SDC theory. So this just gives some information on all three methods used in the app. So this is rounding, record swapping, and suppression. It gives pros and cons for each method as well. So this section here, the input data, so this is where the dummy data sets are contained. So 
in this section, there's two data sets to choose from. So the one I'm going to demonstrate with first is the wide data for the SDC methods. So just click use training data. Uh, this section here within the table is a, a, data, a data summary. So it gives you an idea of what the data set looks like. So in this section here, so this is the input data filtering section. I'll be demonstrating that later with the long data. So this, so what this data set represents in the numbers within the columns are age brackets. And there is a total here, which is a sum of these age, age brackets. The serial variable is a variable that's added by the app primarily for the purposes of filtering. So the first set, uh, method here is rounding. So to do a, a rounding for a data set, you firstly select all variables to be rounded and then select the condition, which in this case I'm going to choose as five. So what this will do here is for all numeric variables selected, all values will be rounded to the chosen condition, which in this case will be five. So all values will be rounded to the nearest five. You'll also notice a notification here. So these shiny notifications gives you an idea if the app has worked as expected and if the app hasn't worked as expected. So I'll give a quick example. So this example is when it's not worked as expected, it'll tell you why it's not. So in this case, there's no input variable selected. So I'm just gonna go to tab four quickly here. So this is to reset the data to its initial state. The main reason this section is in the app is in case any mistakes are made during the SDC methods or any of the other data processing sections. So I'm going to reset it back to its initial state to demonstrate swapping. Uh, for record swapping, the setup of this is essentially the same as doing rounding. So choose all variables to be swapped and then select the condition, which I'm going to keep as a 10. So for record swapping, what will happen is for all the variables have been selected, all the numbers within these selected variables, which are less than or equal to the swapping condition will be swapped within the columns. So in this case, this will be values less than 10. So in this case, this will swap the numbers around. Probably the main disadvantage of this method compared to the other two methods is that any disclosure done in a data set is less visible. So this is where the notifications can really come in handy. So I'm just going to reset it again to go through suppression. So there's two methods of suppression this app can do. So this is firstly primary suppression and then primary and secondary suppression. So the setup for just primary suppression alone is the same as rounding and record swapping. You select all variables that are to be suppressed. So you then choose a condition for suppression. In this case, I'm gonna choose a four. So what will happen here for the selected variables is that for all numbers within this data set that are less than or equal to four will be replaced by a chosen special character, which in this case is a C. So in this, so for, uh, after this, so the all values that are less than or equal to four have now been suppressed. The main disadvantage of just doing primary suppression alone is if, the, if in any role in a data set, only one suppression has been made in the secondary variables and you have a, and these secondary variables sum to a total, then the suppressed value can be deduced. So in this case, so for row one, using the total and the remaining variables, you can deduce that that C is a, was originally a three. So to do primary and secondary suppression, the setup slightly different. So you'd, for variables for primary suppression, you just click the variables that's a total. For secondary suppression, the variables that sum to a total. I'm going to keep the condition as is here. So what will happen for primary and secondary is for the secondary variables, primary suppression will be performed first. And once that has happened for any row that has just one suppression within the selected variables, the next lowest value will also be suppressed. So for row one, both the three and the five will be suppressed. As you can see now for row one, both three and five are suppressed. So this means that the value that was originally a three can no longer be deduced from uh, summing the secondary variables and taken away from the total. So I'm now going to go through the 
filtering and formatting sections of the app. So I'm using the, the long data here. So this is essentially the same data set as before, but it's in a different format. So the main reasons you'd want to maybe do filtering is if you just want to process a certain subset of data within the app. So to perform filtering, you firstly click store unprocessed data, which allows filtering to occur. You then click add filter and you choose a variable that you want to perform filtering on. Once you do that, you then select the values you wish to remove. So just click sensitive A and sensitive B. So this removes all values of sensitive A, sensitive B, and just leaves you with sensitive C. Once you've performed any filtering, you click the clear filter button. You then click store filter data button. So you can add it back in again once the data here has been processed. And once it's been processed, you just need to re-add the filter data. So the final section here is for format transformation. So the reason you would have this section is if a data set is initially given in a long format, this would mean that you would be unable to perform primary and secondary suppression due to being unable to see how the variables link to the total. So to do the format transformation, you just click remove serial. You then choose the key variable as well as the value variable. And uh, once you've done that, you then transform the data set. So this is the same as the wide data was Just giving before. you a two minute warning. Uh, okay, I'm, ju I'm, ju I'm just about wrapping up. So, so once you've uh, done the data transformation, you then and done any sort of process in particular primary and secondary suppression, you then just transform the data back to what it was. And uh, that is how to use the SDC app. Sorry to interrupt. It was just, it was brilliant. Was, okay. uh, I didn't mean to, to interrupt because the flow was great. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was getting near the end. So I don't, I'm guessing there's not enough time for any questions. No, there, there was a question, but it was answered by Alex. But I think for the purposes of the recording, I'm going to read it out anyway because it was really good and it was great that you responded as well. So can the app tell if there's a bad input being inserted, like negative swap values? And I'm just going to read what Alex wrote because I, this is great. It has logic tests, which I found really interesting, to make sure the swap value can only be valid. So it sounds like there's a lot of logic stuff in the background from the other things you talked about in terms of suppression as well. There's a lot oh, of yeah. code, I expect. Oh, yeah, there, there is one more logic that I just want to mention for the functions itself. So the functions themselves are set up so they only process values that are numeric. So any variables, are character variables, for example, will never be processed by accident. Brilliant. Yes, that's a great point. And, and is the code available through GitHub? Uh, not as of yet, no. Okay, right. We look forward to it, though, at some point, because it looks amazing. And lots of people would love to work with that kind of yeah. shiny app, I think. Thank yeah, you so much. I think once we've got the hosting server set up, we should be able yeah. to set the code up with GitHub. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, which comes first, chicken and egg, isn't it? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And our next talk will be from William Bryant, adopting, oh, I love this, reproducible analytical pipelines in a specialist pediatric NHS trust. Um, can be quite a new thing for people, reproducible analytical pipelines. So I'm looking forward to this talk. Welcome, William. Um, thank you. So I, I should add, it's probably attempting to adopt reproducible analytical pipelines, but um, uh, we'll see how we do. So hopefully, can you see my screen? Not yet. No. Oh, I have to press share, don't I? That's it. It's coming. Thank you. There you go. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Will Bryant. I'm a senior data scientist in um, what's called the Digital Research Environment Team at GOSH. So I lead the analytics function in our, in our innovation hub, which is called Drive. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess to, to give you some context, um, I'm in this innovation hub. Um, we support a lot of innovation projects, which include data driven ones. Um, we had previously done a lot of research support, so we have quite a lot of experience of, of using R in various research capacities in the trust. Um, in terms of the trust itself, Great Ormond Street Hospital is a 
specialist paediatric trust. We had an EPIC uh, electronic patient record system deployed um, three years ago. Yeah, three years ago now. Um, we're considered fairly digitally mature and our strategy is around becoming a future intelligent hospital, uh, whatever that means. Um, so what we could see as we were doing our research support was there was a lot of demand from the operational space within the trust to use data better. Um, there's a lot of analytics and dashboarding demand um, coming from clinical teams and operational teams. Um, increasingly, there are a number of machine learning and AI tools that people want to deploy within the trust. Um, and we have a feeling that that's going to explode as time goes on. Um, certainly, it's it's a big area in the uh, DHSC data strategy, um, and it's mentioned in the Goldacre review as well. Um, another thing that people are super keen on is data models and interoperability. <clears throat> so as a specialist paediatric trust, uh, we deal with a lot of very rare and complex diseases, so gathering data sets with sufficient numbers of patients is, is can be very challenging. So we really try to push the idea of uh, moving into uh, consistent, recognized data models uh, and you doing interoperability, uh, you know, through the data. But that means also potentially through through the code and sharing analyses. Um, so the broad aims of um, my uh, the team and, and what we're trying to create to, to address this demand is to formalize the analytics and data processing function um, into what might be considered a clinical informatics unit um, within the trust. So that's a, a big aim. There's a lot of data, a lot of people to, to coordinate. Um, what we want to do is to accelerate projects and enable projects that otherwise would have been unable to do um, and, of course, add as much value as we can to those projects. Um, we want to be able to share our learnings and our best practices, um, be they uh, in terms of documentation about how we've done things or code itself. Um, we want to share our workflows and how to set up the workflows. Um, um, we want to also the capability to adopt external best practice, i.e. other people's code and other people's practices. Um, you'll notice I haven't mentioned reproducible analytical pipelines yet, but there is a, a reason for that. So we'll get to that soon. Um, so what some people call challenges and I call opportunities are things like cross-functional working. So between multiple teams in the trust, um, analytics teams, information services, ICT, information governance, the clinical teams themselves, operational teams. Um, there's also, there are many different projects and many different project sizes from opening SAS files to, to visually inspect them in R to deploying multi-page dashboards with uh, operational views for, for cardiac m, &M meetings. Um, we need agility in, in a, the broad sense. So we do try to adopt agile um, development practices, but you need agility beyond just coding into developing projects because often you don't know what the, um, what the best outcome will be or the best way to address a problem. And that can come from any number of different areas and you need to be able to accommodate changes in what people need and what people think they need. Um, there are IG and cybersecurity uh, requirements for all projects that process data in the trust. And we also need to be very careful, particularly in the current financial climate, about showing the value, uh, the outcomes and the benefits that we can provide as a, as a team. Um, so in terms of the elements that would come together that could support this uh, within the team, um, we'd like flexible reproducible robust solutions, um, ones that don't break when someone puts inputs something incorrectly, uh, ones that can be reused on data sets week in, week out. Um, and we believe strongly, and I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here, that a programmatic approach to developing tools is, is an excellent one to do to enable that. 
uh, we want to be able to safely explore new ground without compromising our previous work and version control addresses that very well. Uh, we want the assurance, uh, you know, and quality control is a big aspect of this. You don't want to be um, miscalculating things or misrepresenting data back to clinical teams who are making, um, at the moment we're, we're limited to operational decisions, but even for just operational decisions, um, it's important. So unique testing assures us that what we say we do with the code, uh, the code actually does. Um, we want to be if efficient and um, consistent in creating new solutions. Um, that's helpful so that we understand the code better, we can share it better. Um, and so we drive that through, could drive that through modularization, functionalization, and common libraries, which is essentially software engineering best practice. Um, we'd like to share our learning and our, our logic, as it were, our business logic across the NHS and open source is the a great way to do that with code and and documentation um and we want to leverage external expertise and experience and again we can we can draw from open code um you know r is is open source python is open source so we're already building on the on the shoulders of giants uh, and code communities such as nhsr community and as we can see the solutions when we bring them all together are more or less the definition of reproducible analytical pipelines. Um, it, they combine all of those features. They provide a structure for for not just the code, but also the way you do coding. Um, the NHSD, uh, I haven't got a link here, sorry, but they have a RAP community of practice, which is openly published on GitHub. So that's got loads of practical advice on how to do RAP, um, how to take it up. Um, and you can also use wrap to inform repo sizes and shapes. So that uh, that's a bit of a funny one, actually. So I'll, I'll explain a little. Um, when you have code that you want to use across multiple projects, um, sometimes, uh, you know, I have, I'm a victim of this myself, or guilty of it rather, that I would just copy lumps of code across or copy lumps of code down in, in a project. Um, so what we can do is use wrap principles to bring those functions, that functionality outside of um, project specific repos and to have more general repos. Um, it gives us a way to think about project management patterns. I think a, a key challenge here is that um, the, a sort of full agile approach to project management um, requires quite large teams sort of three to five um, full-time equivalents on a particular project, whereas often we have um, perhaps one person working two days a week on a project. Um, so working out how to combine that with RAP is, is um, or combine that with software engineering is challenging, but RAP gives us a framework for that. Um, and it really helps us with project standardization. Um, so I will briefly go over um, the, how we've nearly agreed it within the trust to be able to do open source. Um, and then I might rattle through the last few few slides. So um, I created a, an open coding proposal um, and the purpose was to agree the principle to get IG um, sign off um, to do a, a data privacy impact assessment. Um, and to get cybersecurity sign off. Um, so this is probably one of the biggest challenges within within the whole thing. And in fact, that is where we're stuck at the moment. Um, we need final sign off of cybersecurity. Um, but I would argue actually that um, many people are very positive about this sort of work. It's just making sure that the due diligence is done. Um, and I would also argue, my personal opinion is that the a DPIA, a full DPIA, would not be required for open coding, and that individual projects, because open coding is not about data processing, it's about where you store your code and how you share your code. Um, and it's an argument I've yet to have with someone in sort of cybersecurity, but it's something that the information governance team here have, have agreed. Um, 
Yeah, and the, the content was that it, I've talked about the context of data saves lives, the outline of the approach, um, and the list of how we mitigate risks, which is practical steps around things like pre-commit hooks and uh, uh, unit testing and um, uh, GitHub actions. Um, so the agreement subject to that being finalized um, would the, be we'd have an open coding pro forma in which every project that we do that has an open coding element or that will be open source uh, is registered. Um, it's fairly lightweight, but it's just to ensure that we have that um, that um, governance and the tra traceability across this and accountability. Um, and what I'm now working on is an open source protocol, which would take the RAP community of practice guidance, NHSD open source policy, and turn that into something that's specific to our to our needs within the trust. Um, so things that I think support this um, or would support this in the trust are um, the the transition from analytics on an ad hoc basis to a more formal analytics as a service within the trust. Um, I think in fostering an innovation culture within the trust is very helpful and bringing open coding and, and wrap uh, in along for that journey is also really valuable. So you have an opportunity to talk with teams about their projects and what the benefits are. Um, having cross functional teams is really important. Um, a, a bigger, more challenging piece is around data literacy in general in trusts and understanding what what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and uh, data as a product is quite interesting, but probably a subject for another talk. And, you know, potentially using consistent data models is valuable for then sharing into the wider community. Um, next steps, as I said, cybersecurity approval. <clears throat> We're going to work through in the team around what the elements of RAP are that we do already and how we're going to do it um, more consistently and have a protocol for it. I'll develop that protocol um, and then we will begin. Uh, in fact, we will start the process of opening up our repos as soon as the cybersecurity is signed off, fingers crossed. Um, and that will include all of the steps that I've just um, described uh, as one of the elements of the open documentation that we have. Um, so hopefully it's a virtuous cycle that we can open source the way to open source. Um, we're also looking at things around uh, sharing our insights and challenges within the team and sharing that in the wider community in, a, in a documents that we share through GitHub. Closing thoughts. It's a long process. There are many short steps. So we need to be very careful about, um, you know, considering the small steps that we do take and valuing them. Um, project formulation can be very challenging when we're talking to teams who don't really know what what you can do with analytics and what you can do with data. Um, we've been very fortunate in the senior buy-in at the sort of executive level within the trust. Um, but if anyone is interested in getting some insight from that senior level um, in their trust, then uh, several people with the sort of uh, chief research information officer and director of uh, innovation here at the trust would be happy to to talk to people about it. Um, often things that we consider to be blockers are actually kind of due diligence and capacity constraints. Um, around, this is particularly around ICT and IG. Um, and in fact, they're, they're challenges to us to make sure that we have a coherent and sensible approach to this um, that does conform to governance and, and security requirements and that benefits capture is going to be vital to um, be able to sustain and scale this. Thank um, you. A few thanks. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I think it needs its own kind of like uh, conference, doesn't it, RAP? Um, the civil service do have, if you're interested in learning more, also from the NHS Digital link that I shared with their community of RAP that we can sort of try and extend into the NHS. Uh, great presentation. I think it sort of shows it's not just technical things that we have to work with, it's hearts and minds. And although hearts seem to be in this kind of context of open source, mind is still needing a bit of convincing 
in various places and various trusts. So we definitely do need to keep that conversation going. And I will just advertise again the NHSR Slack group for that discussion and contribution to some of the open source that we've already got within um, NHSR community. I'm hoping that we have our next speaker available. Um, but yes. I do. Hi, Zoe. Hi. Hi. So we have Oscar Barufa. I'd like to say thank you before I introduce your talk because you've done a wonderful, it might be about your talk, your big book of R gets mentioned by me and others in our Introduction to r, &R Studio course from NHSR community. So um, thank you before I then introduce your talk, which is general documentation from spreadsheets and databases programmatically. Yeah, Time is thanks. yours. Thanks, hi Zoe. And uh, yeah, it's great to uh, to see you. You actually look just like your Twitter profile. Um, it's amazing. So uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. Um, let's uh, jump straight to it. So. Well, maybe just to sort of, I'm not from the NHS and uh, I'm actually living and working in the Netherlands, but uh, yeah, I've been invited to give a talk and that's a real privilege for me to be able to do so today. So as uh, was mentioned, this is my talk, right? So yeah, you should be able to see my screen. Great. Alrighty. So, all right. So, so this is titled Generating Documents from Spreadsheets or Databases Programmatically. And we will be using Big Book of R as uh, the example here. So just a little bit about myself in case uh, it matters to you. Um, I have been working for about 15 years in sort of various capacities. At the moment, I work as a senior analytics, senior analytics manager in the international development sector. I am the creator and maintainer of Big Book of R. And um, it's uh, yeah my pride and joy. And I've got a few other things on the go that might be of interest to you. I've also got a very short, very short book called uh, Project Management Fundamentals for Data Analysts. I tweet, I uh, blog a lot about data and careers, um, quite especially. And also I have linked at the end of this presentation, these slides as well, right? So just in case uh, you want to get them again, you can have a look. Alrighty, so um, my objectives for this talk is mostly just to make you aware that this is possible. Like when I you know, when I started out and trying to do it, I didn't, I wasn't sure if it was possible. It sort of thought like, surely you can do this, but I couldn't find any examples of it. So hopefully this is just one example to show it's actually fairly straightforward to do this. Um, I won't be going into detail how to, but I do have links to the GitHub repo, then you can have a look at really at the nitty gritty as well of how this works. Um, so I'll be covering Big Book of R as the example. Um, I'll talk a bit about why you might want to do this and then how to do it, as well as a few tips and tricks where, yeah, just knowing these upfront will probably cut off, uh, you know, cut your development time in about half. All right. So for those of you who maybe don't know, Big Book of R is a collection of free books. Well, most of them are free and um, it's publicly available. And it's really, in my opinion, really nicely presented in that it's got a very consistent structure to it. It's got uh, chapters, it's got each book listed with its title, it's got the um, the uh, authors, it's also got links to authors' online profiles if they are there, it's got descriptions of the book, and then of course a link to the book. There's also additional information that if it's a paid book, it inserts some information that what the uh, rough um, sort of cost is. But behind Big Book of R is just a spreadsheet. This one is actually a Google Sheet, um, pu also publicly available. You can go have a look at it. Um, but this is all that paper that powers this, right? So it's pretty, um, it's a pretty simple concept in uh, in that way. Uh, well, yeah. So why might you want to do this? Well, I run into again and again the sort of dichotomy of these two tools is that spreadsheets and databases are great ways for capturing data but for displaying it it's really horrible it's just it do doesn't ever look good right um but when you are using markdown that's great for displaying data but horrible as a data management store but if you marry these two you get the best of both worlds and uh, that's basically what i did right and also what was quite a key driver was i every time i wanted to do simple things like count how many books there are it was really difficult right in a free texts are marked on uh, documents, almost impossible. So data frames are really uh, useful to work with when you draw this in. Um, and just uh, for those maybe who aren't familiar really with writing in Markdown, this is what it would look, right? If you had just two entries, and this is what it used to uh, Big Book of R looked like. But when you've got 300, 
350 of these, it becomes really a nightmare. I mean, I was having so many duplicates or uh, if I had it in one place and I, you know, if I wanted to change a link, I'd go look for all the places that the book in each chapter that it was included in it was really a nightmare. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so, uh, so I ported all this over. Another a reason why you might want to do it is when you again want this to be a single source of truth for multiple outputs. In this case, I use that spreadsheet powers both the um, big book of R web interface, so to speak. There's also a Twitter bot that draws from the same database and randomly, I think it's three or four times a day, tweets about an entry from the book. And likewise, now with uh, Mastodon coming on, I might uh, also make a Mastodon bot. So they're all using the same data store. Um, where I also paused and I thought, mm, you know, it was actually when I was trying to do Big Book of R, the Twitter bots, I thought maybe I have to scrape Big Book of R and then get there. And I thought, well, no, that's, I'm starting to get myself tied up in that. Right? So this became quite a good solution. Um, basically, how you do it is really just a for loop at its very most basic level. Um, I created a markdown document. I load the data set in as a data frame and then loop through every single row of that data frame and use all the uh, different variables to create text and that uh, markdown text is used uh, is using the cat function which i think stands for concatenate and print and um, i'll show you in a moment as well uh, just how this works together with a few other things and when you do that you basically are just taking your data frame and you can start at pit. this is the output you're looking to achieve right for every single entry you're trying to add some markdown ahead of some of the variables you're trying to maybe add a word like for example there's the authors and i'll just say by hadley right and i want to add the description on its own and maybe add a link as well right very very like uh one step that you want to do so how do you actually do this so this is where the mighty for loop comes into play so you create your you've got your arm markdown chunk and then i'm literally just looping through every single one and i'm constructing if you look Closely here, you can sort of see there's my markdown on the, I'm assuming you can see my little cursor here. There's the markdown uh, on the left, and then I'm entering, there's the title, then on the next row, the authors, the next row, the description, and so on. I'm really just simply building it up exactly as I want the output to look. There are, however, a few tricks because it doesn't always behave exactly as you would expect. And there's really these three components that make the output then behave as you expect. You need to set your code chunk to results as is. You need to use the cat, um, which is concatenate and print rather than just the print function. And you also need to make use of excessive line breaks. And that's the only way it can work. Um, yeah, really, I think 80% of my development time was getting around this. Also, I should have read the documentation much sooner because all of this is explained in the documentation in this R Markdown uh, cookbook which I was trying to create exactly this. I wanted to output text as raw markdown content. And in this one chapter, it tells you exactly why you need to use these three things. So anyway, so yeah, read the docs and uh, yeah, probably would have saved me about good six, seven hours. But it's there. Uh, this will explain all the, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but I say let's, at least conceptually from my, my mental model, it you're trying to strip out any sort of interpretation that's are your console or anything else is trying to do of the text that you're creating and really just making it plain text. There are a few other tricks that if you have a look at um, the big book of our repo, you will find. So a few, you'll see like, how is it that I created chapters? I basically just nested two loops in front of, uh, in each other. Um, how do I handle missing data? I make copious use of if else statements everywhere. Um, Creating hyperlink text, you need to like really specifically add your brackets and everything and uh, like um, really verbosely. That's the only downside to the way I'm doing it. Everything does have to be quite verbose. And also things like reordering chapters was um, uh, quite simple, but altogether these things make like a really basic spreadsheet and what are, I would consider very, very basic, um, you know, our program ability to do. Everything I've done could definitely be improved, right? I just stopped whenever something started working, I just stopped improving it any further. So if you look at something, you think, oh, well, maybe surely you could do X, Y, Z. Yes, you definitely can do that. And you should do it better than I did. Um, also, I did this comment very sparsely, right? So if there's something that you're really not sure of, you just want to ask my opinion, you can reach out to me in my email. Um, I've not yet not responded to an email. So you can always email me about something. Um, yeah, so there's uh, some additional 
resources for you. Again, I'll just mention my other little pride and joy is this uh, project management book. You can go have a look. And uh, if you sign up to my newsletter, you'll get a free uh, copy of that. So that's a bonus for you. And um, yeah, all the slides that I've just showed you are at this link at oscarbrufa.com forward slash NHSR. So that is it from me. I think I, yeah, I've put it in my time very well. Yes. I'm quite proud of myself. Much. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. how, how are you finding it with people contributing to this to your book because I contributed a while ago mm. when it was still as a book format so it was all R yeah. and I put in the NHSR community book club yeah. and then I went back to do something else I was like oh it's changed <laughs> it's huge mm -hmm. and yeah. and where is the code and and how do I do this are people kind of discussing it with you via issues or email and then you're doing that bit of work or are they finding the spreadsheet and how does that bit work because yeah yeah, good. That's a really good question. Right? So, and this also touches on why I originally did it as a big plain text file is because I thought it would be much easier for people to contribute. But eventually this exact problem was happening. It was just becoming too difficult for people to contribute. So how it works now is basically, I'd say, equally split between three things. In the read, like either someone will submit an issue that has a book that will tag me on, um, on uh, uh, Twitter that there's a book. Or I've also got a Google form. So within the GitHub repo, I add a, 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 in the README a place for submissions and I add a link to a Google, sorry, a Google form. And then that Google form, I, I personally go and vet every single book uh, before it gets added. But that's worked out quite well. Yeah. I think it's a nice interaction with people who are not our users as well. So we've got lots of people throughout the NHS and local authorities and other organizations that we work with who don't go to github <laughs> they're like yeah. oh what do i do with this so to be able to contribute google spreadsheets and google forms are really familiar and it's yeah, a nice way of yeah. it's a beautiful way of trying to get that information in without having to overload people with that code bit yes, which is yeah. the bit that i was looking for because i liked it but um i can see how this can open it up and would you do it again i mean this this is yeah. started small like this is a great yeah. idea and now it's massive would you uh, do it again uh, I did do it again. So, <laughs> um, although it wasn't just me, that was a collaborative effort. This was going to be another. I'll show you if we've got two seconds. Yeah, yes, I'll we show have. you very quickly. Um, uh, so this was going to be my other example, but there's this other place called R Screencasts, which really does the same thing. But what's behind here, and you can go look at uh, the the GitHub. I think is well. I need to go share it afterwards. But yeah. the GitHub for this is also the exact same so other people there were two uh um, it was alex cookson and uh well i can't remember the other guy's name now eric fletcher they went and time stamped all of another data scientist to, um, called david robertson all of his tidy tuesday screencasts they time stamped it and annotated it all in a google sheet and i'd just done big book of r and and did this thing so i saw okay i can actually probably do the same thing so i sourced their spreadsheets and it creates this right so if you look for example at this um site here then oh it's not sharing all... you're not sharing oh, oh sorry 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 yeah 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 um so here's um here's okay, uh, our screencast right so yeah. if you have a look for example all these timestamps and things are all generated from a spreadsheet and you can jump ahead, you know, and it'll jump to the timestamp thing and you can search by, you know, all these other things. So it was the exact same thing. I think um, this answers a question as well that was how would it work using images? And I guess this kind of interaction would be it. So you'd still perhaps need somebody to write something that then could become, but yeah, or would I'm it not... be different? Do you think you oh, would so, tackle it differently with images? Yeah, um, uh, sure. Yeah, I haven't actually think images. I think as long as it points to a website somewhere, it'll be fine. Like the if the website's hosted somewhere, I mean, that image is hosted somewhere and you've got the address of the image, I think it'll work. But just like with the YouTube, in this example, these are YouTube videos, it's an embed link. Um, so I think it could work, um, but yeah, you would need to probably all your images named in some programmatic way as well right for it to be able to pick up which image <laughs> needs to go with which but it's, yeah it, it has great potential doesn't it and it's a wonderful thing to start from r i think this combination of r with other services as well other systems um so it's not just nhs and it's not just r so i'll just mm. say that 
as I say, thank you very much again for such a wonderful talk and see you around on Twitter and maybe Mastodon as people yes, are moving yeah. across right. being on both <laughs> both social medias. It's wonderful. And thank you for um, coming remotely as well because you're in a different part of Europe for from us as well. So it's nice That's to see you. That's a great pleasure. It's great. Thanks for the invites as well. I yeah. really appreciate it. See you soon. Thanks. Okay, and our next talk is Edwin Theon. Sorry, we're just a little bit over on time. We had a bit of a no technical glitch uh, where okay. we lost colleagues <laughs> and they kept coming back, which is brilliant. So thank you for coming. You'll be talking about Thanks Padar. I don't know how you say Padar, Padar, Padar. Um, I, I, I pronounce this as Padar. Padar. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I probably adopted a little bit of an American accent in the meantime. That, that's probably appropriate, to be fair. Right. Yeah. Um, Convenience functions to transform date time dates ready for analyses. Wow, right. date times. This is going to be good. See you soon. Your Thank turn. You. All right. Can you see my slides? Not yet, I guess. That's it. They've come through now. Yes, thanks. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm also calling in from the Netherlands, so I guess I'm part of a Dutch block here. Um, never met Oscar in person, though, uh, only online. Um, but nice uh, nice talk, Oscar, and I really appreciate your work on the Big Book of R. Um, so from, um, from my side, I'm going to talk about better, as I pronounce it. A um, um, little bit about myself. I work as a data scientist um, at Finda, which is like a housing website. Um, like I think the UK variant is Zoopla, I think, is it? Um, where you advertise houses, is it? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm seeing some nodding. Thank you for the confirmation. Yeah, so um, I work there as a senior data scientist now for five years. I have been working in banking and uh, in consulting, uh, consulting before. Uh, and I'm going to talk you uh, through uh, two, of the, two of the main functions of my uh, R package, which is on CRAN or CRAN, as so many of some people <laughs> pronounce it. So let's not go into there. Uh, uh, and um, I just want to give you like a bird's eye view of what it is and what it does. And also um, why I wrote it back in the days, so already six years ago. Um, and yeah, this is the motivation that I had. So um, I think like many of you, you work a lot with um, data that has in a low level, yeah, what I call a date time variable. So it's either date or timestamp or whatever. But yeah, we all know what it is. It's very hard to put your finger on it, but it's like we know what it is um, um, and then more about that later. Uh, and you, um, I always needed to, what I call, roll up that data, just aggregate it to a higher level. And what frustrated me was that like the things that um, that I wanted to do was perfectly clear to me as a human, but it was very hard to do as a programmer. Um, so I, th I always experienced this discrepancy between how easy I could explain what I would do in words and how hard I actually did it in code so um just as an example of the dirty code that i had to write like you had a timestamp as a posix here right and um um you just wanted to move from uh to monthly data instead of having these timestamp data on the second um well you had to like uh filter out the part that created the month uh, or it was like the, the year and the month and then you had to concatenate with a one again and then you have to like paste that and Put it back as a date and so that that's what i mean with the last bullet point and say there's a discrepancy between feeling and code and i was interested in bridging that discrepancy so the um the output uh um of that work and of that thinking is better which is um in itself it's a small package but it's, it's pretty powerful especially in combination with the aggregating um, packages, or let's say more like the database SQL-like packages, like dplyr or, or data table, or even base R if that's your uh, your cup of tea. Um, but Pattern itself is a package that uh, assists with quickly aggregating data to the right date time uh, analysis um, and also completing records because um, that's actually why the the term Pattern comes from from padding the data so that it's complete. Uh, and that implicit missing variables are turned into explicit missing variables. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate it with um, a, a data set that is um, from Montgomery County, um, a little bit north of Philadelphia, so in one of the suburbs of Philadelphia, and it uh, comes from the emergency center there. Um, it's 
surprisingly hard to find this low level data um, um, uh, in the public in the public databases. So I also looked in the NHS databases to see if I can find anything there. Uh, but typically those data is already aggregated contrary to the most data you have to work with as a as a data scientist or a statistician. So this is a data set that um, I really like to use for this because this is the data that's very much resembles the data that you and I have to work with. And it's um, over 600,000 uh, emergency calls that came in in this Montgomery County um, in the period of 2015 to, to 2020. So before we demonstrate the two main functions, which are Thicken and PET, um, I'd like to, let's say, uh, introduce a little bit the concept of the interval. And that's the thing I came up with, uh, like what, what is it that is missing between code and feeling? And to me, that was that, like, this is the result of that, that uh, let's say, uh, that research. Um, well, that's like research, like something I thought about. <laughs> okay. Um, so the interval, that's the data. So has a you, you you can think of the data having a heartbeat of um, a recurrence pattern that uh, the highest recurrence pattern that fits all the cases in the data. So you can think of a heartbeat where the heartbeat sometimes skips. So it does not have to fit all the occurrences, um, but there should not be a higher recurrence pattern that fits all the data points. And I will give you a few examples just to illustrate this. So here you see um, that we have a, a date variable with um, instances on October 1st, 3rd, and 4th. So you see that you can overlay this with a grid of daily uh, instances. Um, there's no higher grid that can fit this, uh, at least not in the hierarchy of, of better. So in this case, when we change, so just to see the difference, we change the 4th October into the 5th of October. Now it can be overlaid by, with a two-day recurrence pattern. So there's a higher, higher, uh, higher pattern that, um, um, that, that can be overlaid on the data, all the data in the set. And for instance, this one is, has an interval of the month. Of course, it's also, you, it can also be overlaid with a daily pattern but there's a higher level in the hierarchy that can be overlaid of it. And that's why it's naturally, you can say this as an interval month. So both thick and, and pad make use of that interval concept. Um, so the first function I would like to discuss is thicken. Um, and this objecti objective is uh, assist at aggregating data that's too granular. Um, we do this by adding a column of the desired interval and subsequently, you just use your favorite tool to aggregate the data using that column as a, as a grouping variable. Examples. So this is the raw data, a selection of the raw data in that traffic, or not in the traffic, in the emergency data set. And we want to go from this raw level data to such a plot in which we aggregate some the monthly car accidents um, in a nice graph. And you can see the nice effect that having the uh, COVID, well, it's not a nice effect, of course, but you can see the effect of COVID when people were staying in and all of a sudden the car accidents also dropped. So how do we do this? You see like the first three lines, that's just some a deep layer code in which I select the relevant rows um, and columns. Um, so that's just for your information, but the real work from better happens on lines four and five, which you say, we say thicken this data set and do that with the interval month and specify it or like add it to the column month. So that's very simple actually. Um, and what thicken does for you, first of all, it figures out the date time column if there's only one in your data frame. So you don't have to specify which the input column is because it's, that's one of the things I wanted to automate. Like if there's just typically a data frame has only one day time column, so either a date or a POSIX or something like that. So there's no need to specify if there's only one. You only need to specify this for several because then we cannot make up our mind ourselves. And then 
Um, we just basically say um, from every timestamp, just give the month. And by default, we use the first of the month if we specify month. So the column name is just the name of the column. It, it doesn't have to be specified. Um, if you don't specify it, it will take the original column name uh, with the interval added behind it, separated by an underscore. Um, but in this case, we just call it month. All right, so basically that's all fake and dust for you. So it's, it's very simple. It's of course a little bit complicated under the hoods, but uh, I will not bother with you, uh, you with that now. I will do so in the webinar later, more on that on the last slide. And this is how you combine then, um, in this case, um, thicken, the thicken function with your dplyr code. So I use dplyr and ggplot here because that's what most people are familiar with. It's also what I, what's typically my weapon of choices. But um, just you can, of course, substitute it with your data table or your, uh, I don't know, base R plotting. So I'm, I'm not choosing, choosing any sites in Flame Wars here, just to make that very clear. Um, so path is the other function. And its objective is basically to be applied um, after, um, um, after thicken. So a very natural uh, flow of events is thicken aggregate path. That's um, a really, really like a one, two, three, you, ha you have, I happen to apply each time. So in this case, um, we want to make implicit missing observations explicit. And we do this by first figuring out what the interval is of the, um, uh, of the data that is um, uh, in the date time column. And subsequently we insert rows for each missing um, occurrence of that interval. I will show again with an example. So if we used uh, thicken, so now we use heat exhaustion here uh, as an example, as one of the events. It, um, and of course, there's very few of those cases in winter, right? So that typically always happens in summer. So what you see here, um, you probably won't see my cursor if I highlight something, so let me tell it. If you see Luke uh, um, across 2019, you see that from um, the last case in summer, which was very high in uh, uh, summer 2018 until the first case in 2019, there's this really ugly diagonal line which is not a true case, but there is just there should be it should be inserted. What should be inserted there are many records with zero for the day. So um, how do you create this? So this is the plot we are after. This is a true plot of the heat exhaustion compared to this. If you don't um, do right the proper date padding, you also see that they never go back to zero. They always aren't one because there are no zeros in the data frame. So. This is how that heat set was created, like that create uh, that that will underlie the wrong plot. We filtered and selected the heat exhaustion, and then we selected the title timestamp and um, town part. Not sure why I selected town part; it's not necessary, but anyway. And then we thickened it onto to the week from the raw timestamp, like explained in um, in the thickened function. Uh, section and then we simply use the dplyr function count to get the occurrences for each week and that will result in the data uh, data frame that you see below if we plotted this then we get this plot so what does pat do for you it inserts uh, the weekly patterns that are missing right so we go from this in which there was one occurrence in uh, April 2016, but the next occurrence was only in um, in May, and there were like one or two weeks missing. And you see that apparently there were two. Those are like inserted like so. And um, subsequently, there's also some convenience function in Padder to fill those values. So the inserted rows have missing values for each of the um, for each of the columns that are not a daytime column. And um, we can do a convenience function in pattern, it's filled by value. There are also functions like that in the tidyverse. Um, so it's a little bit up to the user how you want to, um, what do you want to do with the inserted rows? Uh, sometimes you also want to carry the last value forward instead of insert it by zero. In this case, inserting it by zero is appropriate. And now you see after padding, 
and having this fill by value function applied, then we have a correct plot of our heat exhaustion. I'm just going to give right. you a warning, a minute warning. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm wrapping up. Thank you. All right, here we are. Um, so um, next, uh, next to this um, short overview, I will also do a webinar that will be uh, uh, in two weeks, two weeks from now on Friday, the 25th, three to four. I'm not sure if there's still places available. I assume there are. Um, and uh, this would also be part of this NHR, uh, NHSR conference. So there we will go into a more, um, also the other functionality of better. And um, I will also give some detail in the inner workings of Pat and Thicken. So if you want to uh, apply those, the logic on, let's say, maybe on a database because your data doesn't fit in memory, uh, I will give you some, uh, some handles for that. So that's me. Here you can find the source code, my email, and my Twitter handle um, in case you want to still contact me. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. It's like one of those talks where you think, why didn't I know about that package sooner? That I needed that so much for my other code. I can think of it in terms of using it with SPC charts, which are a really big thing in um, the NHS, all right. um, statistical process control charts, and fitting in those zeros. I've done all sorts of convoluted code before just to fit those in so that it runs better and you get decent charts out of it. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for everybody who's come along today. Um, oh, there is a question. Can you pad with zeros before the first non-zero or after the last non-zero? Um, oh, so, so I mean, suppose prior. So uh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So not starting, yeah. not starting on the first occurrence, but like have zeros mm. before. So say the first occurrence is in July, and you want to start from January. Mm. Yes, you can. You you can. There is there are two parameters called start date and end date. So by default, you start padding. Um, so there are a lot of defaults, uh, which which suffice nine out of ten, but there are custom parameters for cases cases like that. So yes. Fantastic question. Um, just to say, all of these talks have been recorded. They'll be uploaded to YouTube super quick. The previous ones are already up there, and I I suspect your workshop, if it hasn't already been, it will be fully booked. But don't worry, because if it's recorded, it will also be on YouTube as well. So people can catch up later, particularly as people are joining us as well internationally. And we might be on different time zones and you yourself have come in from um, the Netherlands. So thank you so much for joining us and showing us that package. I just wish I'd had that years ago, <laughs> but it will now appear you have in my now. code. So yeah. thank you so much, everybody. Uh, the conference will continue next week, both in person and virtually. So everybody who does a talk, I think, in person will also be recorded. So please do join us. There are tickets available still for both. So if you're in the area of Birmingham, particularly for international colleagues and, uh, and European colleagues, come and join us. Uh, we're in Birmingham and I'll wrap it up now because it's lunchtime, everybody. I hope you've had a wonderful time. Thanks for your interactions and um, your patience when we had that technical glitch, but it didn't last too long, but these things happen. So see you next week, I hope. Thank you very much, everybody.